All right. <laughs> so we are halfway towards the end of the lecturing portion of 16100 because the last uh, quarter is uh, really your design project, right? And that means we are also halfway into our second module that's incompressible potential flow. So what we have looked at so far is potential flow theory with the focus on two-dimensional potential flows, right? So in particular, within potential flows, we know that there is this fantastic principle of superposition. If we know one flow field and another flow field, both are potential flow, incompressible potential flow, we can add them together. And that's a perfectly valid potential incompressible flow field. And we also know that Bernoulli satisfies global everywhere, right? So the stagnation pressure is equal to a constant no matter where you go. So we use that principle to study the aerodynamic shape and the lift of an airfoil. We did this by super, superposing a free stream velocity with multiple what we call elementary potential flow elements. We had vortices and the sources. The negative of sources are really six, right? So basically we placed a lot of these elements together and we constructed flows around airfoils. So today we are going to do that furthermore and uh, apply this, the same principle to asymmetric airfoils. And uh, also look at how the lift, how the flow field changes. And as a result, how the lift changes as you increase or decrease the angle of attack. And that goes into the study of aerodynamic stability. All right, so that's what we're going to be doing today. So the first of all, uh, we did the lab on Friday, right? And uh, this is, I think, a collection of all your measurements put on top of X-Foil's prediction. So all these lines, I think, I'm pretty sure this is in time order, right, Mohammed? Uh, when you sent me the data, is it the other columns? Uh, yeah. The order of how people measured it. So, so you can look at the colors and find uh, what is your data, which one is your data. All right. So we see that some of them matches the prediction pretty well. Others may not. I mean, the only thing that I don't have x foil prediction is the green line. The green line is measured at angle of attack of 20, and uh, we know well ahead of time that x foil prediction is going to be way off at 20 degrees angle of attack. The airfoil, the wing is completely stalled at that point. And when the wing is completely stalled, uh, you also have effects from the end walls because the end walls are not right against the plates. So there are flow that's going to come over through the gaps and uh, there will be three-dimensional vortices. We'll talk about that on Wednesday. Uh, so, so basically any two-dimensional prediction is going to be wrong. So we don't even bother to have prediction on this green one. Okay, we, we'll talk more about this uh, uh, when we talk about viscous flows. But for all the other measurements, for example, uh, this measurement on the negative 10 angle of attack is really just the pressure side, the bottom side of the airfoil, right, at 10 degrees angle of attack. That matches X foil almost uh, exactly, right? And also, this red line at 10 degrees angle of attack. Oh, uh, sorry, this red line is at 5 degrees angle of attack also matches X foil 5 degrees angle of attack pretty well, except for over here. And there is a very good excuse for why the measurement differs over here. Let's actually, because X foil actually predicts the pressure exactly on the surface of the airfoil. But when you measure it, right, remember this pitot tube has finite thickness. 
So what you are really measuring, if you go to the uh, web page, what you actually are measuring is not going to be exactly on the surface. So for example, if you really look at 1%, right, x equal to 10, and look at, uh, look at how the pressure changes as you move away from the airfoil. So when my point, pointer is exactly on the surface, you see the pressure is minus 0.97, right? If you translate that into pressure coefficient, that will be minus 1.94. But if you move away a little bit, let me move my cursor like halfway between this and uh, the surface and the next streamline. Let's see how the pressure changes from negative 0.97 to what? <clears throat> it changes from negative 0.97 to negative 0.59, a very significant change. We can actually read that from just the shape of the airfoil, right? So we know the flow goes very, we know that because the pressure is very low, the velocity goes very fast, right, at that point. And we see a very high radius of curvature at that point. So that means flow goes very fast and turns very fast. Centrifugal force, right, is proportional to velocity, velocity squared over r, right? So high velocity squared, small r, means something has to provide a very high centripetal force for the flow to turn very fast over that point. And what is providing that force? Pressure gradient. That means the pressure gradient in the orthogonal direction of the flow has to be very high. Right? That is why when you put a probe over here, you see a big gap between the actual pressure on the airfoil and what you can measure. Right? This is basically due to the high curvature and high velocity over here. When you move a little bit away, the pressure is very different. Okay? When you go back uh, downstream, it is uh, the pressure gradient is going to be much, much lower. For example, if I measure the uh, pressure over here, minus 0.37, and if I move halfway between this streamline and uh, uh, the streamline above, minus 0.36, <laughs> not that different, <clears throat> right? So, so this is uh, uh, partly explains why this measurement is, uh, is uh, uh, not accurate over here, but more accurate over here. Uh, other measurements are not as good. Uh, I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, maybe the shaky hand or something like that. All right, but like uh, uh, basically some of you got very good data over here. Congrats. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, take one of these data, actually the one that's shown in red over here at 5 degrees angle of attack. And uh, uh, this is taken at a stagnation pressure of 0.5. The unit doesn't matter, right? Basically, we know that uh, when we are, uh, we are actually measuring voltage over here, and we know the voltage is directly proportional to pressure, right? So let me ask you, can you compute, right, from groups of uh, a two or three, and uh, can you try to compute just the, from this that <coughs> what is the lift coefficient of this airfoil? All right, and uh, what what I'm asking you to do is ignore the pressure side for now because the lift is going to be a contribution of the pressure side, the underside of the airfoil pushing the airfoil up. Plus the, uh, plus the top side of the airfoil having negative pressure sucking the airfoil up, right? So the lift is going to be a combination of these two forces. What I want you to calculate is just the contribution from the top of the airfoil. All right. Can you calculate what, how much does the top side of the airfoil contribute to the lift coefficient? Can you calculate it from over here, please? Okay, so that's question one. Question two, I also want you to work on, is where is the center of lift? So, can somebody tell me 
what does it mean by the center of a distributed force like this? When we say a center of a force, what does it mean? Where is the average position of it? What is the average position of it, and what does it mean by the average position? That's correct, but uh, I want a little bit more quantitative, something like you can actually put into calculation. Yeah, what does average mean in this case? Yes? It's a what? The integral of the lift across the cord, uh, you are right in the sense that you can calculate, I mean, one of the one of the best ways to calculate the center of lift is done through such an integral, but an integral of what? Yes? Yes, an integral of position weighted by the lift magnitude. That is right because of why. Okay, so when we talk about the center of a distributed force, like center of gravity, for example, right? If you study hydrostatics, uh, there is also center of uh, flotation. I mean, the, there are a lot of uh, uh, places in engineering and science that you will have to calculate the center of a distributed force. So what does it mean? It only it, it makes the most sense when you are considering a distributed force on a solid body that you consider cannot deform. And the center of uh, any force is very useful in that case because if the distributed li uh, distributed force like lift is on the solid body, you can consider the distributed lift as if it operates only on a single point. Okay, you can do so because around that single point, that distributed force is like a pure force has zero moment. Okay, zero moment. So you are really trying to find the center, find the location at which that distributed force creates zero moment. So how do you do that? I mean, that's what we that's the integral method or the average or like basically uh, I, let me just uh, put it in a little bit more quantitative way right you are trying to find in this case you are trying to find the x center okay over which there is no moment so what does it mean by no moment it means when you sum up the contribution of the lift to the moment around that point, the sum or integral is equal to zero, right? So what is the what is the integral of the contribution? So if you integrate, for example, in this case, the force is the pressure force, right? P dx, uh, of course, times the span, right? Pressure times dx times b is a force, right? It's a force over infinitesimal uh, Delta span, infinitesimal dx. Okay, how much moment does that force create around that point? Right, it is. Uh, well, let, let me write this b inside so that uh, it's a little bit easier for you to comprehend. Uh, so this is uh, uh, dx times b is the surface area, right? So that's this is the an infinitesimal amount of force. So what is the corresponding infinitesimal amount of moment around that x c point? Yes, multiplied by uh depend on which direction you, you use. I mean it's either x minus x c or x c minus x, right? Either way is fine because I mean just uh, changes the sign of the, the moment. Okay? So that has to be equal to zero, right? Okay, so then if you just um, rearrange this integral, move the minus x part to the right and keep the xc part on the left, and you can get rid of b because uh, it will appear on both sides, what happens is that the integral of pressure times just the dx 
times xc, which is a constant you can pull out, would have to be equal to an integral of p times x times dx, right? Okay, so that means xc would have to be equal to the integral of p times x times dx divided by integral of p times dx. I mean, if you are familiar with uh, uh, the average of a continuous force or the like, the average in a calculus way, this is an average of the x location weighted by the pressure. All right, so this is really the most uh, general way to figure out the center of anything, the center of any distributed force like gravity, lift, flotation, whatever. All right, okay, so let's uh, split into groups and uh, go from here to calculate, first of all, what is the lift coefficient? And the second, uh, where is the center of lift? Just uh, from this table of like uh, 15 ish data points. <laughs> All right, so maybe let's get back uh, to lectures. I, I think I saw uh, everybody has the formulas correct. Uh, maybe some of uh, you made a mistake in your calculator or something that got. Uh, a slightly different answer, but uh, I I think I see half of you get a lift coefficient uh, close to 0.5, right? Yeah. yeah, and the center of uh, lift uh, basically like on the range of uh, uh, 20, on the range of like 27% uh, to 30%, right? So kind of uh, on that range. Right, so how many of you got uh, into this range? Okay, okay, pretty good, pretty good. I, I think, but everybody got the formula correct. So if I, uh, there are several alternatives of a different formula, but uh, they should all crunch out to similar numbers because we are always approximating these integrals, right? There are many different ways of approximating the integrals and you get slightly different answers. So these are fine. Okay, so the center of lift is very important. Remember that uh, this data is uh, slightly off near the leading edge. So one question for you is if you had considered this gap, so if these numbers were a little bit more negative in the first uh, uh, 5%, would that center of lift be closer to the leading edge or closer to the trading edge? If you take into consideration of that discrepancy, close to the leading edge. Why? Exactly. So if you just consider this a little bit, uh, you are going to get something closer to the leading edge. So the true center of lift, according to, I mean, if you are considering thin air flow theory, right? This has to be around uh, 25%, a quarter chord. So what you get, uh, 27 to 30%, considering this dis discrepancy, is actually very accurate. All right. Okay, so, so this is cool. This is, I think, a very good exercise for you to actually uh, think numerically, right? Uh, how do you compute the center of lift? And uh, this conceptual understanding is very important as we are going to really look into how the center of lift shifts as we change things. Okay, um, so one thing that you learned in Unified is the performance of thin, very thin airfoils, right? At the conclusion, we just uh, tried to derive numerically that the uh, center of lift is at the quarter chord actually is probably something you already learned in Unified. But here, I just want to show you how the pressure over a real airfoil deviates from the pressure distribution over a very thin airfoil. <laughs> so this is, I just put several images taken from X-foil on top of each other. So that's why you see these as blurred. Uh, uh, one is a Naka 005, that's a very thin, very, very thin airfoil. 
Okay, one is Naka double ten. That's a slightly thicker, but still pretty thin airfoil. And uh, the third one is Naka double fifteen. So that's the airfoil we tested uh, downstairs. So these are the three airfoils, right? Uh, Naka double five, ten, and fifteen. <coughs> So these are the three pressure distributions. Can somebody guess which one is which? Yes? The sharper one fitting like this one? No, you said you're shaking your head. Okay, okay. Right, so since we measured the thicker one, right, and uh, the thicker one is actually closer to this. I mean, you remember what is the peak suction you guys measured at five degrees, like five degrees angle of attack. Right, the peak suction, uh, whatever, whatever uh, stagnation pressure used, right? If you divide uh, the minimum pressure by the stagnation pressure you guys measured, it should be somewhere between 1 and 2, right? Uh, I don't think uh, nobody measured anything lower than minus 2, right, at 5 degrees angle of attack. All right, so that one corresponds to the thickest airfoil. And uh, this one has a slightly more peak, uh, a slightly higher peak is the Naka double 10. And this one that choose to I don't know, <laughs> it corresponds to the thinnest airfoil. So, the sharp one actually is very, very close to the prediction of thin airfoil theory, right? This sharp one actually is going to have a center of lift uh, almost uh, precisely at 0.25. But the <coughs> Uh, the, the thicker airfoils, although the pressure distribution looks kind of different, but two things are important. One is they qualitatively look the same, right? The difference, the pressure difference between the upper side of the airfoil and the lower side of the airfoil, they all are large near the leading edge, although how large is different, the, the thing is therefore is actually extremely large the pressure difference, while the thicker airfoils are less large, but they, nevertheless they are <laughs> largest, the pressure difference is the largest near the leading edge, and they shrink towards the trailing edge and go to zero at the trailing edge. Right, so, so the difference in the pressure has the same qualitative trend. And if you compute the center of this distribution, all of them are very, very close to 0.25. Okay, the thicker ones are slightly more downstream of 0.25, maybe 0.26 or something, but uh, pretty close. Okay, so this is uh, this is the most uh, important thing to remember about what we both learned in Unified and what we are going to go through a little bit later today uh, using the result of thin airflow theory is that. Well, thin airfoil theory, if you look at the details, they are not correct, right, for the thicker airfoils. But the overall qualitative trend, no matter if the pressure is uh, higher over here, smaller over there, or the center of the lift is at 0.25, they are qualitatively all correct. Okay, so now, given these assumptions, uh, given this fact, let's review what we actually assumed to derive the results of thin airfoil theory. Okay, uh, we derived a thin airfoil theory, assuming that the airfoil is very thin and the angle of attack is very small. So these two assumptions leads to the <coughs> conclusion that the velocity on the surface of the airfoil is practically horizontal. Right, so if you look at a thick airfoil over here, the velocity is definitely not horizontal, but if you look at a thin airfoil, and small angle of attack, the velocity is pretty much horizontal. Okay, so what's the result of this? The result of this is when you are considering to how do you construct a flow field outside the thin airfoil, 
by placing a bunch of sources and things and vortices. One is that the strength of the source and things and vortices needs to be very small, right? Because uh, you don't have to create much disturbance for a thin air foil and small angle of attack. And two is that in order to get the flow field to be tangential to the surface of the airfoil, you only need to manipulate the vertical velocity because the horizontal velocity doesn't matter, the flow goes pretty much tangential anyway. Okay? Because the flow goes pretty much tangential with a small angle, let's say theta, right? Manipulating the horizontal velocity gives you a contribution that's cosine theta, that's basically pretty much close to one. Uh, manipulating the vertical velocity gives you a sine effect, which is uh, much more significant for smaller angles. All right? So, so under these assumptions, Basically, uh, we even further simplify the incompressible potential flows. Basically, incompressible potential flows tells you that we can add two velocity fields and it's a perfectly valid velocity field. And the thin layer flow theory assumption further says that the x velocity doesn't matter when you are composing different velocity fields. You only consider the effect of y velocity. That's how we reach the conclusion that if you double the angle of attack, <coughs> we double the strength of the vortices. Why? Because double the angle of attack means the free string component gets added, uh, get, gets gets doubled in the y direction. The x direction doesn't matter, right? Okay, the free string doubles in that direction, which means if you want to cancel the doubled uh, free string in the y direction, you just double all the vortices. Again, if you only consider the y directional velocity, that makes perfect sense, right? So, so the uh, effect of a linear superposition actually works even better to our favor in the context of thin air flow theory. So uh, this is not uh, a class in which we are going to actually do all the calculus derivation of the thin air flow theory. It's uh, just uh, just too much to do in class. I mean, if you're interested, you can read through all the calculus. It actually maybe takes you uh, four to eight hours, I would say, <laughs> to actually understand all the calculus. But uh, it doesn't uh, really matter in the practical sense. All we need to know uh, in practice is, is, is what are the assumptions and what are the conclusions. Okay, so the assumptions are thin airfoil, a thin airfoil, and small angle of attack. And we already looked at how much the real case deviates from that assumption. The conclusion is first of all, the changing angle of attack, right? If you increase the angle of attack, according to thin airflow theory, you just add a bunch of vortices inside the airfoil corresponding to the flat plate solution. Right, so if you look at uh, uh, this case, this is the, a very thin airfoil, like a 006. And the middle one, the center one, corresponds to zero angle of attack. So this one is zero degrees angle of attack. All right. Guess which one is one degree angle of attack. Guess which one is two degrees angle of attack. Right. So these two are one degrees angle of attack on the lower surface and upper surface. This is two degrees on the lower surface and upper surface. What's noteworthy is the prediction of the thin air flow theory, which is actually pretty true over here, is the gap between zero and one degrees is exactly the same as the gap between one and two degrees. Well, of course, that doesn't really hold at the leading edge because even if the airflow is at that thing, right, right at the leading edge, the angle is not <laughs> small, right? So thin air flow theory never is exactly true at the leading edge, but if you just uh, uh, mask the very leading edge, everything else is pretty correct, right, for thin air flow theory. And 
that prediction holds mm -hmm. actually not just for symmetric airfoils. That also holds for asymmetric airfoils. So this is looking at an asymmetric airfoil, right? It's a Naka 5504. So just uh, uh, to make it more dramatic, uh, the, the camber is actually pretty large, so 5%. And uh, the maximum camber is over here. It's, uh, like the camber is almost a, a parabolic one. And now, from the experience there and the thin for theory, can you guess which one is at one degree angle of attack? Which line is at one degree angle of attack? The one in the middle, the in the middle right? Right? Because according to thin for theory, the effect of changing angle of attack, right, no matter increase or decrease, is adding exactly the same function as in this case. Right, so so basically, a thinner for theory predicts that this gap, no matter this gap or this gap or this gap, is exactly the same. It's a universal function. It's a thin plate solution. Right, the vortex distribution you need to specify to get a flat plate at a small angle of attack. So, if you Increase the angle of attack, you shift from here to here, right? At this universal function. If you decrease the angle of attack, you shift from here to here. Subtract that universal function. Same thing on the lower surface, right? If you increase the angle of attack, you shift down for that same universal function. You increase or you decrease the angle of attack, you shift up on the lower surface for exactly the same universal function. And what is critical is that the center of that universal function is located at 0.25, a quarter chord. All right. Now, let's consider uh, probably the most important thing. That is, where does the center of lift shift? Okay. And uh, we do that uh, uh, just uh, let's say consider the upper surface for now, just as what we do, did before. So let's consider uh, the airfoil at one degree angle of attack for now. All right. So let's consider what is the center of lift. As we said, that the xc at let me say xc1, so that's the center of lift at one degree angle of attack, is equal to what? Is equal to the ratio between two integrals. Oops. The first integral is an integral of pressure times x times dx. <coughs> the denominator is just the integral of pressure times dx, right? That's exactly what we did before. Okay? Now, what is CX2? So let's say this point, uh, this curve, corresponds to 2 degrees angle of attack. So C, uh, not C, not XC2 would be equal to, let me actually call this P1, because this is the pressure distribution at 1 degree angle of attack. So the pressure distribution at two degrees of angle of attack is P1 minus this universal function, right? So this universal function, let me just call it a pressure of a flat plate, Fp. Okay, so that is uh, uh, times x times dx. Okay, and the divided by uh, the same thing, but uh, also P1 minus P flat plate. Okay. Now, here's the question. 
Is Xc2 less than Xc1 or greater than Xc1? Why is this question important? That's before the, yeah. Xc2 should be further that way. Xc2 should be further that way. Right, so, so you, you have said the answer to the question, uh, which is great. Uh, why is this question important, right? Yeah? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, as I said, the center of lift, like the center of any distributed force, determines how a solid body would respond to that lift, right? So, it is equivalent. If I have the center of lift here, it is equivalent of as if the lift operates exactly at one point. So, if you use that airplane as the wing of an airplane and you want the airplane to fly in a balanced way, right, which means the lift cancels with the gravity force, both in magnitude, direction, and in its moment, where should the center of gravity be for that airplane? Exactly center of lift, right? Because if the center of both the gravity and lift is a distributed force, right? So they both have different centers. If the centers do not coincide, then no matter where you put the origin to be, you have a net moment, right? On the airplane. So the airplane is going to rotate. So for the airplane to actually fly in a balanced way, right? No matter if it's stable balance or unstable balance. You have to have the center of lift coincide exactly with the center of moment, uh, with the center of gravity. So, and center of gravity doesn't depend on the angle of attack, right? I mean, no matter how you rotate it, the, the center of gravity of a solid body doesn't change. So, the only thing that changes as you change the angle of attack is the center of lift. So, imagine at one degree angle of attack, you have the center of lift coincide with the center of gravity. And at two degrees angle of attack, if you pitch up a little bit, the center of gravity doesn't change. The center of lift shifts forward. What happens? You have gravity still at the same point. Lift shifts forward. You have a net rotation to pitch up. Right? On the other hand, if you pitch down and the center of lift shifts downstream, you have a net moment rotating there for no stop. So, so that would be a classical example of an unstable balance, right? It's as if you put a ball on top of a hill, right? At that point, it's a, it's a balance, but if you roll it this way, it'll keep rolling that way. If you roll it that way, it'll keep rolling that way. So, so that's the scenario where Cx2 would be more or less than Cx1. So what's corresponding to this unstable balance? No, not, not Cx2, Xc, Xc1, Xc2. So, so when would that happen? At two degrees, x would be what compared to, huh? Yes. So if at two degrees, right, the center of lift is less than the center of lift at one degrees, I would get an unstable airfoil. Right? Any uh, any questions on on that? Or why that's the case? Right? So so if at two degrees, if at one degree I'm exactly balanced, right? At two degrees x becomes smaller, that means the center of lift shifts upstream. My center of gravity is still over here, that lift is going to rotate the airfoil to further nose up, right? Okay, and a stable solution 
is like when you put a ball over here, right? That's basically uh, corresponds to the scenario where xc1 is greater than xc2. Okay. Right? Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, the other way, sorry. <clears throat> you see, I get confused myself. So this is, uh, yeah, this is, uh, um, you really have to think about it carefully. In this case, when I increase the angle of attack, x also increases, the center of lift also increases. So if I nose up, the center of lift shifts downstream, x increases, right? That creates a moment uh, that points out of the board. That will restore the airfoil to its original angle of attack. Okay. Now let's figure out just from these two integrals how can we distinguish whether the airfoil is stable or unstable. To do that, yeah, you have a question? No? To do that, let's manipulate the formula for xc2 a little bit more. So xc2, the center of lift at uh, changed, uh, uh, changed angle is equal to, let me split both the denominator and the numerator into two integrals. One integral is exactly the same as the integral of the uh, xc1 minus right the other is actually let me see let me use green for the other the other is a contribution for the flat plate solution and the numerator also the same p1 x dx minus uh, let me use green for that one. Uh, flat plate solution x dx. All right. And note that if I'm looking at the upper side of the airfoil, right, both these are negative, <coughs> right? I'm looking at such, okay, which means both of these are negative and uh, the green ones are positive. We also know that for the flat plate solution, if I divide the PFPX dx by integral of PFP dx, that's going to be exactly equal to the quarter chord, right? <coughs> Now the question is, okay, we know this green thing is exactly one quarter of the green integral in the denominator. So if I subtract something from both the numerator and denominator, would the ratio become larger or smaller? That boils down to that final question. Right? If I have a ratio that is equal to xc1, and if I subtract something from the denominator and subtract a quarter of that something right, from the numerator, would the ratio become larger or smaller? Well, we know that if the original ratio is 1 to 4, then it doesn't matter, right? If the original ratio is 1 to 4, and if you add or subtract to denominator and numerator at the same proportion, then the ratio is still 1 to 4. Which means, <coughs> as long as the original center of lift is at the quarter chord, then the airfoil is going to be neutrally stable. Okay, that's exactly what we saw for the symmetric airfoils, right? The symmetric airfoils are usually neutrally stable. But that's one conclusion. And this also points to the subtle effect that the 
stability actually depends on where xc1 is originally. If xc1 is originally greater than the quarter point, greater than 0.25, remember these are both negative, right? Then you subtract something from the original negative thing, right? And the ratio is 1 to 4. Okay, what would it be? So, so let's say if this is 1, this is 2. So the, the original, it is pretty much this case, right? Let's say if the original uh, center of lift is at half chord, 0.5, that means this is a negative number like minus 1, this is a negative number like minus 2, right? If you further subtract it, but you subtract something only per quarter, right, in the numerator and uh, uh, one in the denominator, what do you get? Just an example, right? So, so if this is, uh, if this is uh, uh, example, if this is minus one over minus two, and uh, this as an example is minus one over minus two, but subtract another minus one, subtract another minus two. What do you get as this example? You get one third, right? So that means you have a center of lift shifting upstream as you pitch up. It's gonna be a, an unstable situation. Okay, so this is actually a general conclusion that if the airfoil is already providing positive lift and the center of lift is downstream of the quarter cord, then as you increase the angle of attack, the center of lift is going to shift towards the quarter cord, which means it's unstable. <laughs> the only case to make the airplane stable would be have the center of lift to be ahead of the quarter chord to start with, right? So that's the other example. That is, if the center of lift is ahead of the quarter chord, let's say minus one over minus six, okay? Then in this example, you have minus one uh, over minus six, but you subtract one, still subtract four, right? In this case, what do you get? You get one fifth, right? So the center of lift as you pitch up shifts from one sixth of the chord to one fifth of the chord. It shifts downstream. That's a stable situation because as you pitch up, the center of lift shifts downstream, right? Okay, so. If we trust in thin airflow theory, then whether a wing is stable or not purely depends on where its center of lift is. If the center of lift is upstream of the quarter cord, it's stable. If the center of lift is downstream of the quarter cord, it's unstable. That's the conclusion we reached. Okay, so when we come on Wednesday, we are going to use that conclusion and generalize that conclusion a little bit more to look at the combination of multiple airfoils and the multiple wings. And that really goes into how to design an airplane for stability, right? How much of a horizontal tail you add, how much of a canard you have to add. I'll see you on Wednesday. Mm -hmm.